Mr. Chair and members of the commission, we are now live. Good evening and welcome to the March 10, 2023 meeting of the, of the Montgomery County Historic Preservation Commission. My name is Bob Sutton, I'm the chair, and I would like for our commission members and staff to introduce themselves starting on my left. Cristina Arado. Jeffrey Haynes. Karen Burdett. Commissioner Doman. Zara, Zara Nasser. Mark Dimignani. Michael Galway. Rebecca Ballow, Historic Preservation Staff, also for the May 10th meeting. John Labert, Historic Preservation Staff. Casey Rowan, Historic Preservation Staff. Melissa Williams, Planning Staff. Thank you. The first item on our agenda tonight is a public hearing and work session list, listing um, to the local, to the locational atlas, an index of historic sites, and to the master plan for historic preservation amendment. We will take testimony from the public and hold a work session and public hearing on the proposed amendment. We will also receive a briefing on the Tacoma Park minor master plan amendment process, timeline, and draft recommendations. And at this point, I will turn it over to staff of Casey Roan and Melissa Williams. Okay, good evening. My name is Melissa Williams and I am the project lead for the Tacoma Park Minor Master Plan Amendment. Um, my presentation is, um, I'm sorry, this is a presentation of the Minor Master Plan Amendment, including our general draft recommendations. This plan is a minor amendment to the approved and adopted 2000 Tacoma Park Master Plan and is a joint effort with the City of Tacoma Park. Although it is a minor amendment, it has its own vision, a defined boundary, and provides the recommendations typically found in a master plan. These recommendations include land use and zoning, historic resources, environment, transportation, parks and open space, community and public facilities. This is the plan timeline. We have made considerable progress since fall of 2021 when the scope of work was approved by the planning board. We are now transitioning from the visioning phase and anticipate having a working draft by late May. The, star, the red stars indicate where resolutions of support from the city of Tacoma Park will be needed. These resolutions are for the working draft plan used for the public hearing and the planning board draft plan that goes to the county council. The county council has final approval authority for the plan. We anticipate an approved and adopted plan for fall of 2023. This plan provides a minor update to the 2000 Tacoma Park Master Plan and has a defined boundary, including roughly 132 acres. The planning board approved this boundary in 2021. The plan area boundary includes the following, the former Washington Adventist Hospital, the Washington Adventist University, the Erie Center at Flower Avenue and Erie Avenue, multifamily residential along Maple and Lee Avenues, the Tacoma Park Community Center and Library on Maple Avenue, and the Tacoma Park Public Works buildings on Ritchie Avenue. It is important to note that plan recommendations for zoning are limited to the area within the plan boundary. The diversity of the community and the impact of the pandemic require creativity and a multi-pronged approach towards engagement. We used a translation service to make sure that documents and other materials were available in French, Spanish, and Amharic. Staff also combined traditional outreach and engagement techniques such as pop-ups pop -ups, and attending community meetings as well as using social media and other online strategies to reach more than 550 stakeholders. Our most significant effort involved meeting traditionally hard to reach communities through door knocking and canvassing in the multifamily apartments located along Maple and Lee Avenues. We also organized events for student input at the Washington Adventist University. These events provided us with takeaways and insight into how people use the community today and what residents and other stakeholders would like to see in the future. What were those takeaways? Residents enjoyed living in Tacoma Park, but were concerned about re retaining the community's affordability and about losing the hospital and other assets such as the swimming pool located at Piney Branch Elementary School. 
They were excited about the potential for development on the Washington Adventist campus as a way to provide for public amenities like walkable retail and community gathering spaces. They also wanted to make sure that the plan recognized the importance of protecting Sligo Creek. The vision, of, um, the vision for this plan reflects the common themes that we heard throughout our engagement process. The stakeholders love their community and want to see it protected. They shared concerns regarding resiliency, the need um, for new uses for old spaces, and the desire for improved connections. That resulted in the following vision statement. The plan area will build on existing assets to be a resilient, reimagined, and reconnected community with new housing and other uses, greener and safer streets, and improved access to amenities. This next section is focused on the area-wide or general plan recommendations. The goal for the land use and zoning recommendations is to create pedestrian-friendly areas containing a variety of amenities and neighborhood-serving uses. The plan recommends flexible, compatible zoning that can be adaptive to market conditions while retaining community character. This is also an opportunity to remove obsolete zoning and address any zoning inconsistencies. The plan sees an opportunity for new public amenities, including a green promenade, which would connect the plan area via safer sidewalks, new and enhanced parks and open spaces, and new bike lanes. The plan will also make recommendations about new and improved public facilities, including for those colo including for co-located co facilities such as police recreation, and there's also a need for, um, and also as needed for schools. The plan area has lots of access to transit, but hilly topography and aging sidewalks can make Maple Avenue and Flower Avenue feel disconnected. The plan makes improving these avenues a priority. Climate resiliency is the capacity to anticipate, cope, and manage the impacts from climate change. Staff identified the most egregious climate threats, such as stormwater management, extreme heat and storms, and developed recommendations to adapt and mitigate its unpredictability. The plan makes the following recommendations. Support the city's stormwater uh, management program to reduce untreated stormwater runoff and potential flood rates. Incentivize energy efficient and net zero buildings and site design, including alternative energy generation. Remove obstacles to community gardening, food forests, and urban agriculture, and improve access to nutritious foods. Reduce urban heat island temperatures and increase resiliency through the application of nature-based climate solutions. Implement cool streets elements into the streetscape. Prioritize preservation and restoration of natural areas, including those with steep slopes. Provide a minimum of 35% green cover on new construction and minimize impervious surfaces on redevelopment sites. And finally, protect Sligo Creek from construction impacts. As part of the engagement process, a canvassing effort, a canvassing effort was made in the multifamily residential units along Maple and Lee Avenues. These recommendations reflect the comments that were heard from those residents. Um, once again, they loved living in the plan area and were afraid of being priced out in the future. There was also a desire to see varied housing types and the need for more code enforcement. The plan area is home to numerous parks and open spaces, including Sligo Creek Stream Valley Park, which is the largest park within the plan area. The plan makes recommendations to improve it and protect it along with addressing the specific neighborhood or district needs for additional park infrastructure or open space. And finally, we are refining the plan recommendations as a part of our preparation of the working draft. We will present that draft to the Tacoma Park City Council for comment on May 24th, and will return on June 7th to ask for a resolution of support. A planning board briefing will follow on June 8th, where we will ask the board, we will ask for board comments and for permission to set a July public hearing date. And that completes my presentation. Thank you. Casey?
Okay, good evening. I'm Casey Roan. I'm the historic preservation planner that's been working with Melissa and the rest of the Tacoma Park Minor Master Plan Amendment team. And I'm going to continue the discussion of the plan with um, our historic preservation recommendations. So in the presentation, I'm going to quickly review the historic designation process um, and then present our preliminary recommendations, starting with the proposed historic designation of three sites and then the additional recommendations for historic and cultural resources and then end with the staff recommendation. So as a reminder of the designation process, it begins with staff review. Uh, we make a recommendation to the Historic Preservation Commission as to whether we think the recommended site meets the designation criteria outlined in the county's Historic Preservation Ordinance. The Historic Preservation Commission then makes a recommendation to the Planning Board as to whether the site should be listed in the Locational Atlas and Index of Historic Sites and eventually to the Master Plan for Historic Preservation. The planning board will then hold a public hearing and work session on the matter to make a determination about whether the site will be listed in the locational atlas, and then they make a recommendation to the county council as to whether the site should be designated in the master plan. Then the county council will go through a process of public hearings and work sessions, and if they recommend approval, um, then the approved and adopted plan will be an official amendment to the master plan for historic preservation, designating any of the sites that you recommend. Uh, as a reminder, the decisions about whether to place resources on the locational atlas and the master plan for historic preservation are based in the county's historic preservation uh, ordinance and the outlined historic designation criteria. There are two sets of criteria, one for historical and cultural significance and one set for architectural and design significance. In order for a site to be designated, it must be found to meet at least one of these criteria. Okay, so we'll begin with the historic designations. Um, the first site we'll be discussing is the Hefner Park Community Center at 42 Oswego Avenue. Um, this is a uh, recreation center that was built by the city of Tacoma Park in 1959 as a segregated recreation facility for the city's black residents. Um, this building and the park uh, are representative of years of advocacy by the city's African American residents to demand recreational outlets in the years preceding the county's public accommodations law in 1962, which prohibited discrimination in public facilities. The building's small scale and general lack of ornamentation reflect the limited resources set aside for this facility in the city's budget. The red star here at the left indicates the location of the site within our master plan boundary. Um, the 0.74 acre trapezoidal parcel uh, includes the community center and about a half acre recreation area to the west. And the proposed environmental setting is the entire parcel historically associated with the park. Uh, the next few slides will orient you to the site and the building. Uh, the community center is a one-story cross gable roofed building with a utilitarian appearance and an overall lack of ornamentation. The building's facade faces north, uh, perpendicular to Oswego Avenue, and the center consists of the main block and a projecting uh, gable roofed front porch which was recently enclosed which shelters the double leaf front door leading to the main multi-purpose room. And the park's recreation area is to the west of the building. The west and south elevations continue the simple fenestration seen on the north and east of the building. The history of Hefner Park falls within a broader context of segregated recreation in the United States. Um, African Americans and other non-dominant groups were denied access to the parks that proliferated around the country in the early to mid 20th century. Uh, these resources were developed in a period of legalized segregation, leading many black communities to rely on self-help and advocacy to develop their own sites for recreation and leisure. And this pattern is reflected in Tacoma Park. The Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, MNCPPC, held primary responsibility for the county's recreational facilities and programs from its inception in 1927 through the establishment of the Department of Recreation in 1953. 
Through this era, MNC PPC established parks, playgrounds, and recreational facilities in heavily populated areas, mostly down county, including in Tacoma Park, which I'll discuss shortly. Uh, Montgomery County did not begin to integrate its recreation activities until 1955. Hefner Park sits within a historically African-American neighborhood known as The Hill, which coalesced around 1920 in a hilly area along Ritchie, Geneva, and Oswego Avenues. Residents of The Hill built local uh, social and community institutions, including a church and a Rosenwald school, to mitigate the effects of racial discrimination. One unmet community need was for a recreation space. Parks and playgrounds were open to white residents only in Tacoma Park. In 1941, the Parent Teachers Association of the Tacoma Park Rosenwald School asked the city to provide playground equipment for this school. Um, this request marks the documented beginning of black residents' campaign to gain access to recreation and play space, which 18 years later resulted in the uh, construction of the Hefner Park Community Center. This campaign was largely led by the Tacoma Park Colored Citizens Association. This organization formed in the 1920s to advocate for the provision of fair, the fair provision of public services to black communities, including street paving, regular garbage pickups, utility connections, and funding for the school. Um, the CCA elected Lee Jordan as president in 1948. Lee Jordan was born in Mississippi in 1909, and his family moved to Tacoma Park in 1918, where he grew up on Ritchie Avenue in the Hill. As an adult, Jordan worked as a custodian at the all-white Montgomery Blair uh, High School and then at the Tacoma Park Junior High until his retirement in 1973. Through these jobs and his community service, he became a mentor and a coach who worked to bridge racial divides. The city of Tacoma Park recognizes Lee Jordan as one of the most influential figures to ever um, live in the city um, due to his leadership in youth sports and recreation. His efforts to integrate youth athletics are seen as integral to the peaceful racial integration of Tacoma Park's public schools after the Brown versus Board of Ed ruling. Jordan actively took on the role of leading the CCA's campaign for recreational resources in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, city Council and CCA meeting minutes show uh, repeated requests for a playground and a rec center through these years. Uh, and Jordan appears countless times at City Council meetings, uh, writing letters, and meeting with city staff and elected officials on this issue. Over the same period, in the late 1940s to early 1950s, MNC PPC constructed the segregated Tacoma Park Recreation Center for the city's white residents only, as African Americans were campaigning for equal access to recreation facilities. The new park provided modern indoor and outdoor recreational amenities on an approximately 13-acre site. Finally, in April of 1950, nine years after requests began, the city purchased three lots on Oswego Avenue um, for a, quote, colored playground. Um, this was the original location of Hefner Park, and today is the site of the city's public works facility. So this area is outlined in red on the map. Um, the city did not act very quickly to develop this park, um, but eventually they established a playground and ball fields on the site by the mid-1950s. Uh, and Af African Americans in Tacoma Park finally had a place to play and gather outdoors. Uh, the city named the park in honor of city councilman Herman Hefner in 1952. Um, still, uh, while the site was very welcome, it did not include a recreation building. And Lee Jordan recognized that black teenagers in particular needed a place for club meetings and to hold dances and parties. And so he continued to press for that, um, that sort of facility. On March 22, 1954, seemingly without any prior public discussion, the city announced the purchase of a lot just north of the original Hefner Park site for use as the city's new public works facility. The facility was being ro relocated to facilitate new development along Maple Avenue. And the proposed site, outlined in yellow, that, that is the present day location of Hefner Park. Uh, residents of the Hill immediately began to protest the siting of the public works facility in their neighborhood and um, were concerned about the anticipated nuisance and hazards of this facility being placed um, right in the midst of their neighborhood. Um, today, we would identify this as an instance of environmental racism in which uh, 
which is characterized by policies or practices which disproportionately burden communities of color with noxious facilities or air, water, and waste pollution. The exact chain of events at this point is not clear in the historic record, but in May of 1958, the city announced that an agreement had been reached uh, to interchange the two sites, to take the existing Hefner Park for the public works facility, and to create a new park and recreation building at the other lot on Oswego Avenue that was first proposed for the public works site. The news that the existing Hefner Park would close came as a painful shock to the park's patrons. Uh, residents remember feeling that without the park, they had nowhere to go. And the site that they had fought so long for was being taken from them. The city began planning for a simple recreation building designed by architect Philip Mason, uh, who was designing the new public works facility. Um, both buildings were finished and opened uh, to the public on September 13th of 1959. Uh, Lee Jordan met with city representatives and the County Department of Recreation to work out programming for the new center. The group planned a new teenage recreation program, including games and dancings, dancing that would be held on Fridays from 7.30 to 10.30 p.m. And the first gathering of this teen club was held on October 30th, 1959. The teen club was small, but it provided a place for black teenagers to host parties, play records, dance, and eat together. And it became a gathering place not just for teenagers from Tacoma Park, but from neighboring African American communities surrounding Silver Spring who were barred from other public social venues. The Hefner Park Community Center filled this really important social gap until Montgomery County adopted the public accommodations law in 1962, which eventually gave African American young people more options for places to gather. Um, I want to pause here and note that we will, would like to make a technical correction to the designation report, which cites the date of the public accommodations law as 1962. Um, that's essentially just a typo, and so we would like to go back and correct that to 1962 and any future versions of the report. So I just want to clarify. Oh, okay. It says 63 in the report, <laughs> and we would like it to say 62. Thank you. Um, and also, we have set the um, period of significance for the site as ending at 63 and the uh, basis of corresponding with this law. So we would also adjust that back to 1962, which is what we meant. Um, okay, so proceeding with the narrative here, um, since the 1960s, the park has continued to operate as a community center and a rental space operated by the city's Department of Recreation, offering drop-in programming and classes and serving um, as a place for birthday parties and family gatherings. Uh, staff found that Hefner Park meets three of our historic designation criteria. Uh, 1A, for its association with the development of the Hill community in the early to mid 20th century and the creation of a grassroots social support network that was developed to meet social and community needs amid racial segregation. Um, 1C, it is a reflection of the civic leadership and advocacy of Lee Jordan, particularly his, uh, his uh, emphasis on the importance of recreation. And there are no other designated historic sites which reflect his legacy. And for 1D, as a reminder of discriminatory public policy, including segregated recreation and environmental racism. So I'd like to pause here and ask whether the uh, commission would like to discuss this item now um, or ask any questions or proceed with the other, um, the, the rest of the presentation. I will find out. <laughs> would, would, um, would the uh, commission members um, prefer to have all of the sites presented at once or have questions on this particular one? All at once, I hear all at once. Everybody agree to that? Okay. Well, if you need to take a breath. Oh, I drank some seltzer. So oh, thank good. You. So if you don't mind, I think we would prefer having them all at once. Okay, thank great. You. Thank you. Uh, sure, we'll, we'll press on. So our next site is Crestview at 7625 Carroll Avenue. Uh, this is a two-story craftsman-style bungalow constructed in 1909. 
Um, the home reflects the local growth of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and is strongly associated with Drs. Daniel and Loretta Crest, who were prominent Adventist medical missionaries and physicians who acquired the property in 1918. The Crest House is located on an irregularly shaped 0.73 acre lot northeast of the historic Carroll Avenue Bridge. And the proposed environmental setting is the entire parcel, which includes the primary dwelling, a former garage, the stone retaining wall, and the terrace gardens. The property slopes steeply to Sligo Creek on the south and west, and to the north, the property faces the former Washington Adventist Hospital site and the Washington Adventist University campus. Crestview is a masonry building sitting on concrete piers and a raised basement, and a now enclosed wraparound porch spans the entire uh, front and west elevations. In 2019, the property owners made significant alterations to the rear of the house, including the construction of a one-story enclosed porch on the eastern half of the building and the expansion of the existing dormer to create a fully exposed second floor. The front yard uh, slopes down steeply towards Carroll Avenue, where a crenellated stone retaining wall, which is well over eight feet in height, uh, separates the yard from the public sidewalk. And the home's rear yard consists of a series of terraces supported by concrete and uh, concrete re retaining walls and dry laid masonry walls. And a mid 20th century detached three car garage is located near the southeast corner of the property along Palmer Lane. Seventh-day Adventist church leaders relocated the church headquarters from Battle Creek, Michigan to Tacoma Park and Tacoma, D.C. at the beginning of the 20th century. Tacoma Park was an ideal location near the nation's capital, a beautiful natural environment which aligned with their deeply held beliefs in healthy living, uh, and plenty of space to establish a healthcare facility and a missionary training school. These institutions, the Washington Missionary College, established in 1904, and the Washington Sanitarium, established in 1907, formed the core of a new Adventist hub in Tacoma Park and sparked a massive in-migration of Seventh-day Adventists. Um, Adventist sources estimate that upwards of 2,000 church members moved to Tacoma Park in the early part of the 20th century. Church leaders purchased and subdivided land in Tacoma Park to facilitate the growth of the local Adventist community. Uh, Arthur G. Daniels, then president of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, and Edwin R. Palmer, uh, then director of the Review and Herald Publishing Association, subdivided the lot on which Crestview was built. It was an attractive location for uh, members of the church community due to its proximity to the sanitarium and college, and the block attracted prominent Adventists who bought and rented homes here in the first third of the 20th century. In May of 1909, Palmer sold lot 15 to George A. and Nettie Irwin, who built the house that stands today. The Irwins were prominent figures and early among the earliest Adventists to arrive in Tacoma Park. And George Irwin was given significant responsibility for opening the new sanitarium, including participating in recruiting the leaders of the new institution. He strongly recommended bringing medical missionaries Daniel and Loretta Cress back from their service in Australia to take charge of the Washington Sanitarium. Doctors Daniel Hartman Cress and Loretta Eby Cress were physicians who promoted faith-based health care around the world by serving as Adventist medical missionaries in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. They were integral to the founding and operation of Adventist sanitariums in England, Australia, and the United States. Uh, medical missionary work was very important to the Adventist evangelical outreach in the late 19th and 20th centuries and allowed them to reach people through health care that they never would have otherwise. The doctor's crests were seen as experienced sanitarium leaders, um, medical practitioners, as well as spiritually committed. They arrived in Tacoma Park on May 3rd, 1907, and finished leading the facility to its opening ceremonies on June 12th, 1907. Dr. Daniel Kress was appointed as the first superintendent of the sanitarium, and Dr. Loretta Kress was on the uh, medical staff and was appointed as the sanitarium's first surgeon. Dr. Loretta Kress was licensed to practice medicine in, in Montgomery County in 1908, making her this, only the second woman to hold a medical license in the county. She specialized in obstetrics and was a prolific deliverer of babies. Uh, most sources credit her with delivering uh, between four and 5,000 babies in her career, including some delivered at her home, Crestview. 
Um, in addition to her hands-on role in delivery, uh, she led an expansion and professionalization of the Washington Sanitarium's obstetrics program. She simultaneously served as the sanitarium's chief surgeon and oversaw a new dedicated maternity department that opened in an annex built circa 1913. In 1918, a new hospital building opened adjacent to the sanitarium, seen here at the left, and it provided modern spaces for emergency care, obstetrics, and included a surgery ward called Cress Ward in her honor. By 1922, the Crest Maternity and Children's Hospital had moved to a separate building on Flower Avenue across from the campus with a dedicated staff of doctors and nurses. The new center met an increasing demand for professional maternity and pediatric care as the medical profession urged a transition away from home births. In addition to Dr. Daniel Kress's leadership role at the Washington Sanitarium, he was a noted public health expert and an early anti-smoking advocate. Uh, he lectured about the topic um, to audiences around the country, and in 1931 wrote and published the pamphlet called The Cigarette as a Physician Sees It. Um, the pamphlet specifically targeted young people in an effort to um, help them never start smoking. Uh, and it included endorsements from celebrity non-smokers, including Walter Johnson, who was a pitcher for the Washington Senators. The Crest home at 7625 Carroll Avenue was a hub that allowed them to meet their professional needs and serve a prominent role in the community. An undated photograph of the house from their autobiography shows the wraparound porch before it was enclosed, as well as a small outbuilding that is no longer extant. Uh, after moving into the home, the Cresses made many repairs over the period of a few years as money became available. Uh, these included the likely enclosure of the front porch, uh, the renovation of the basement to serve as a home medical office, and dedicated improvements to the grounds that made the house a gathering place for friends and patients. Um, the doctors Cress lived in the home until their retirement to Florida in 1939. Um, staff found that Crestview meets two of the county's designation criteria. Uh, 1A, for its association with the growth of the Seventh-day Adventist institutions in Tacoma Park and as part of a subdivision that was created by and for Adventist leaders. Um, and 1C for its association with Drs. Daniel and Loretta Cress, prominent medical missionaries who were called to Tacoma Park to lead the opening of the new Washington Sanitarium. The Cresses lived here as they did their most prominent work in public health and maternal health care. And Dr. Loretta Cress was an early and influential woman doctor. Our third recommended site is the Sligo Seventh-day Adventist Church at 7700 Carroll Avenue. The Sligo Church is a three-story, wedge-shaped, streamlined modern building of steel, fr steel frame construction that was built between 1942 and 1944, with a two-story addition built in 1985. In addition to being an excellent and singular representation of the streamlined modern style, the church is significant as the home of a progressive congregation within the global Seventh-day Adventist Church. The Sligo Church is located on a 1.23 acre lot bound by Flower Avenue to the west, Carroll Avenue to the south, and Greenwood Avenue to the east with Washington Adventist University property to the north. The large wedge-shaped church occupies a significant portion of the site and sits at an angle facing southwest towards the intersection of Carroll and Flower Avenues. And the proposed environmental setting is again the entire parcel. The next two slides will orient you to the building before we discuss it in more detail. Um, the building that you see today is made up of the original 1944 section, highlighted in red, um, and a 1985 addition, highlighted in blue, which encapsulated the east facade of the original building. The building, the building faces southwest, and the elevations described in the report and the presentation are as shown here. The south elevation includes both the front of the original church and part of the 1985 addition. The south elevation, the front of the building, uh, features a symmetrically, symmetrically arranged facade consisting of two vestibules flanking a central portico with an enclosed arcade opening. The projecting vestibules are each composed of joined two and one story rectangular bays that cascade out from the face of the building and feature recessed arched entryways capped with cast stone segmental arches. 
Seven light steel frame vertical ribbon windows flank each entry bay. The west elevation largely reflects the church's original design. Towards the front of the building, uh, five two-story vertical ribbon windows are located within recessed bays. These windows feature decorative stone screens and incised stone lintels. The north uh, elevation of the church, the rear, features a two-story steel multi-pane multi chancel window placed above a one-story rear bay. This large chancel window was added as part of a 2003-2004 renovation campaign to add more light into the interior of the sanctuary, and it replaced a smaller existing window. The 1985 addition is visible on the east side. Um, the addition is comprised of a five-bay rectangular block facing Greenwood Avenue to the east. On the south elevation, the addition contains two projecting three-story stairwell towers flanking a one-story central pavilion, containing an arcade of six segmental arched openings. The west stairwell is connected by a two-story hyphen to the western projecting pavilion on the front of the original building, and that's, that connection is seen here at the right. The church is set back from the intersection by a grassy lawn and limited low-scale ground plantings that focus attention on the church building. A paved concrete walkway extends um, from the public sidewalks along Flower and Carroll Avenues and provides access to a curved uh, concrete plaza and stairs that ascend to the main entrance. The building is raised above street level, uh, lending it a sense of prominence in the landscape despite its relatively low height and horizontal layout. The projecting bays and landscape design cascade towards the street and welcome worshipers inside. On October 12, 1907, 54 employees and students of the sanitarium and college organized the cemetery and sanitarium church. In 1908, the church began meeting in the second floor chapel of College Hall, today's science building, on Washington um, mission, Foreign Missionary Seminary campus. Uh, the college changed names several times over the, the course of this history, so I'll be using the name that corresponds with, with each time period, but it will change. In 1914, the church adopted a simpler name, calling themselves Sligo Church. And as the congregation grew, they helped the Washington Missionary College build a new academic building, which included a large chapel. Columbia Hall opened in 1919 near the northwest corner of Carroll and Flower Avenues and housed the Sligo Church until 1944. Columbia Hall was destroyed by fire in 1970. By the early 1940s, the Sligo Church had began to plan for a standalone church building. The large congregation had nearly 1,300 members with an additional 700 college students who attended as space permitted. They announced plans to build a new house of worship in January of 1941. The proposed church would seat 1,500 people. The church purchased the lot at the northeast corner of Carroll and Flower Avenues from the college, which had acquired it in 1933. The existing house was relocated to Greenwood Avenue and later reused as a church office. The church hired J. Raymond Mims as project architect and Herbert Hubbard as the builder. Uh, Mims was a regional architect who worked extensively in Virginia, and among his most notable projects is the 1948 Al's Motors Automobile Showroom, which was a significant example of streamlined modern design in Arlington County that was individually listed to the National Register in 2003. Hubbard worked on a number of Adventist building projects throughout his career. The project broke ground on March 2nd, 1942, and immediately faced labor and material shortages due to World War II. Hubbard was somehow able to acquire the massive amount of material needed, including the steel for the frame um, seen here, and 28 carloads of Indiana limestone for the exterior. Mims' design met the needs of this large and growing congregation. His, cho his choice of a streamlined modern style allowed for a plan that drew on auditorium style and balcony seating rather than a more traditional cruciform or rectangular shape. Four wide banks of pews slope downward to face the chancel at the northeast end of the building. A balcony provides approximately 10 rows of additional seating above the main floor. Historically, the Adventists have built a limited number of megachurches, which are defined as those seating over 2,000 worshipers. They built these around the country in places where Adventist institutions are concentrated, including Tacoma Park. 
Uh, this included the circa 1879 Dime Tabernacle at Wright um, in Battle Creek, Michigan, which seated 4,000 worshipers using a semicircular seating and balcony plan like that employed at Sligo. The Sligo Church predated a national pattern of megachurch building that emerged among evangelical faiths in the latter part of the 20th century. On the exterior, the church embodies the defining characteristics of the streamlined modern style. The design features smooth surfaces, curved corners, and an emphasis on horizontality. The church's exterior is predominantly composed of smooth panels of Indiana limestone with limited ornamentation, and embellishment is found only at low relief decorative stonework at window and door openings. The symmetrical wedge-shaped plan captures the style's aerodynamic aesthetic, while the projecting rectangular bays on the church's facade reflect um, the style's common use of joined rectangular and curved blocks to add visual interest and dimension to these typically blocky buildings. The church's shallow roof reinforces the horizontality of the overall form. The streamlined modern style was part of a national design movement that emerged in the late 1930s and early 1940s. Its restrained materials and ornamentation were sensitive to widely reduced economic circumstances due to the Great Depression, while its sleek lines provided a sense of stability and control in a period of great upheaval. The style also reflects an age in which advancing technology was accelerating many aspects of life. Um, this pervasive sense of speed and forward progress influenced the design of many products, including buildings, uh, which were imbued with smooth forms and curved lines. This style had a brief period of popularity and in our region is seen primarily in commercial and residential architecture. Americans were generally resistant to adopting modernist styles for church architecture through the post-World War II era. Uh, and most churches constructed in this period throughout the country and here in Montgomery County were built in revival styles. As far as we could determine from our survey, Sligo Church is a singular example of a streamlined modern house of worship in the county. It represents an early use of modernist religious architecture that predates the more widespread acceptance of contemporary styles that came in the late 1950s. Most modernist churches in Montgomery County were built in the post-war era of suburban expansion and therefore reflect later design trends. A useful comparison, uh, comparative example is the nearby Tacoma Park Seventh-day Adventist Church, which is an outstanding resource in the Tacoma Park Master Plan Historic District. It was built a decade after the Sligo Church and still utilized a Gothic revival style. The Sligo Church's striking modern design really stands out in the landscape. The church is also a highly successful example of ecclesiastical architecture that is clearly legible as a house of worship. MIM's design brings elements of traditional religious architecture into a modern form. The church's Indiana limestone exterior and horizontal lines convey permanence and groundedness uh, corresponding to the sincerity of religious practice, while the building's curved lines, harmonious colors and shapes, and visual symmetry lend a sense of gracefulness. MIMS utilized the hallmarks of streamlined modern style to create a commanding but serene presence for the church and its prominent corner site. The restrained ornamentation is in keeping with the streamlined modern style and also befitting of Seventh-day Adventist values and design precepts, which promote simplicity, limited ornamentation, and avoidance of vanity. The limited number of windows and their stone screens reflect the idea that a sanctuary should be a place for focused worship and not distraction by the outside world. The Sligo Church also holds significance as the site of pioneering advances towards racial integration and gender equity within the Adventist faith. Through the late 1950s, the Sligo Church practiced racial segregation in keeping with the norms of their denomination. African Americans were not allowed as members and could not be baptized or attend services. Um, black Adventists around the country worshiped in separate places of worship, even as the civil rights movement broadly mounted pressure for racial integration in American society. William A. Loveless was appointed as associate pastor at Sligo in 1957, and he was named lead pastor of the 2400 member congregation in 1961. Adventist records hold that uh, Loveless began to challenge Sligo Church's discriminatory policy as soon as he arrived, and that he pressed the Sligo Church board to consider the matter despite being counseled by his elders not to bring the topic up. 
After considerable debate on the issue, the Sligo Church Board reversed their policy um, and it began admitting African American members in 1962. This preceded the Greater Seventh-day Adventist Church's General Conference's move to begin gradual desegregation of the denomination in 1965. African Americans joined Sligo Church and took on leadership positions even as the larger uh, denomination worked to desegregate. The church has also played a prominent role in the advancement of women ministers within the worldwide Seventh-day Adventist Church. Adventists have debated the ordination of women since the 19th century, and the issue was increasingly discussed and supported by North American Adventists in the 1970s and 1980s. In 1973, the Sligo Church made two historic appointments. Um, Kit Watts became Sligo's first female pastor when she was appointed as Minister of Publications, and shortly thereafter, Josephine Benton was appointed as associate pastor, which did not require her to be ordained, but it still made her the first woman to hold the title of associate pastor in the North American Adventist Church. Divisions within the Adventist denomination over women's ordination culminated in a proposal made by, the, by North American Adventists at a July 1955 um, general conference, a global meeting of the church that supported the ordination of pastors without regard to gender. Uh, but in a bitter setback, this proposal was widely defeated by the world governing body on July 5th, 1995. Members of the Sligo Church reacted swiftly, calling a special church business session to recognize the demoralizing impact of this vote and the absolute necessity of a grassroots initiative on the matter of justice for women. Less than a month after the vote, Sligo resolved to move forward with women's ordination with or without the support of their governing bodies. On September 23rd, 1995, more than 1,100 people gathered at the Sligo Church to witness the Adventist Church's first ordination of women to the gospel ministry. Penny Shell, Norma Osborne, and Kendra Holoviak were ordained and granted ministerial credentials. Um, this event gen generated significant attention even outside of the Adventist faith for um, breaking the, the norms of the church. And it began a tradition at Sligo of the ordination of women ministers. So, and to date, over a dozen women have been ordained at the church, um, giving them a reputation as a trailblazer. Staff found that the Sligo Church meets three uh, designation criteria related to both historical and cultural and architectural and design significance. For 1A, um, for its association with the growth of Seventh-day Adventist institutions in Tacoma Park, it was founded concurrently with the nearby Washington Sanitarium and Washington Training College, and was Sligo Church's first standalone church building, which has occupied continuously for nearly 80 years, and has also been the site of pioneering advances towards racial, and racial integration and gender equity. For 2A, uh, it is an excellent example of streamlined modern design. It displays many of the style's defining features, as, and it is also a successful example of ecclesiastical architecture that brings traditional religious elements into a modern design while reflecting Seventh-day Adventist values. And for 2E, the church takes advantage of its prominent corner site at the intersection of Carroll and Flower Avenues, um, and is a prototypical megachurch that seated nearly 3,000 parishioners and it is distinct among Montgomery County's houses of worship for its streamlined modern design. That concludes the designation recommendations. So I'll quickly review the remaining historical and cultural resources recommendations um, proposed in the Tacoma Park Minor Master Plan Amendment. These are to study Tacoma Park's historic African-American neighborhoods for potential future listing in the Master Plan for Historic Preservation and or the National Register. There are a series of recommendations for the Washington Adventist University campus to collaborate with property owners to study a potential National Register Historic District, which would open state and federal historic preservation tax credit opportunities, to retain the central commons as the organizing feature around which the campus historically developed, to renew the site's historic physical and visual connection to Sligo Creek, to retain the crenellated stone retaining walls lining Carroll Avenue, and to pursue opportunities for adaptive reuse of campus buildings. We also recommend promoting further study of potentially significant themes and resources within the plan area that we couldn't fully explore in this effort. Um, those include the mid-century housing developments along Mabel Avenue, 
the small scale multifamily housing near Erie and Maplewood Avenues, uh, the history of local LGBTQ pioneers and advocates, and Tacoma Park's history of social activism and the development of community political identity. We also recommend uh, partnering with local stakeholders to add more public interpretation of underrepresented histories in places where historic buildings have been lost. Um, possible topics could include um, further information on Lee Jordan, the Washington Sanitarium, um, and the infrastructure improvements that enabled the development along Maple Avenue. We also could provide technical assistance to the city in any future efforts to determine the origins of local street names and promote the mapping segregation project and continued education, research, and interpretation around the history of discriminatory housing practices and its impacts in Tacoma Park. With that, um, now I'm forgetting our procedure. I'll proceed with the staff recommendations. Right. Okay. So. The staff recommends that the Historic Preservation Commission recommends that the Planning Board, okay, I feel like I've missed it, that the Historic Preservation Commission recommends that the Planning Board list the three subject properties in the Locational Atlas and Index of Historic Sites, and that the Historic Preservation Commission recommends that the Planning Board recommend to the County Council that the three subject properties be designated in the Master Plan for Historic Preservation, and that the Historic Preservation Commission transmits comments regarding uh, any staff recommendations in the plan for consideration by the Planning Board and County Council. And that concludes the staff presentation. Thank you. If you want to take a breath, <laughs> we will let you. Um, I, would, I would suggest that we uh, start from our end uh, asking any questions you might have of Ms. Williams, and I will entertain anybody who's interested in asking questions first. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, now are there any questions of uh, Ms. Roan for the, uh, the, the, this presentation? Commissioner Doman. This is Commissioner Doman. Um, I want to thank you for the all-inclusive, very detailed, long <laughs> work that you did, I don't know, it's uh, uh, apparently over two years or something like this, a lot of work went into this obvious and uh, your presentation was uh, excellent presentation, I want to say that much and we always uh, appreciate the work the staff does. It, um, you guys have always come through and done very good work. My one question, um, I just really have a lot of trouble with the, the Hefner recreation site and I, I did visit all of all of the sites. I drove around and I and I was I did not know that um, the Seventh Day Adventists had such a presence in Tacoma Park. It was an eye opener for me to see that how how they were how they were involved with the creation of the of um, a lot of the society in the area and the houses along Carroll Avenue and everything. I did drive up to see Hefner Park. And it's almost um, non-existent. Um, it's very small. The road dead ends, I guess, into the um, uh, county facility that's located down there. And I did park the car. The building is, as you described, is very nondescript. Uh, it has absolutely no architectural feature that I could see of any value on the thing. And the park itself is as you mentioned, probably about a half acre, maybe smaller. And um, it looks like to me that the area of significance is only from about 1959 to 1962, which only puts about three years of significance for this building. Is that correct, uh, that we have for this? That is the period that we recommended, yes. Yeah. Is, now, is the building currently used? When I, when I looked in, it's locked, of course, but when I looked in, it looked... Um, unused or um, not well kept, I guess I'd say. I, I believe it, based on my conversations with the city staff, I uh, believe it to be actively used for uh, recreational programming and classes. On Do you know how basis. it is accessed? Is there um 
that you, you can reserve, like you would reserve a city park facility, contact the Department of Recreation, and make a reservation to use the facility, and then they can provide remote access to the building um, for anyone who has made a record res reservation to use the space. I didn't. <coughs> is there is there any heat in the building? Do you know? Is it used in the winter time also? Yes. Yes. It is heated, so mm -hmm. it can be used in the winter time also. Yes. And I assume that there are. Um, bathroom facilities in the building also? Yes. Okay. It's hard to see looking in the windows and everything. It, and does that also adjoin, it looks like to me there's uh, one of your drawings, it, it backs up to another park area, is that correct? Yes, it backs up to the city's dog park and to the uh, Piney Branch, the Tacoma Piney Branch local park. Which we can go back and, and look at the map if you would like. It's way back there. Um, yes. Yeah. Oh. Uh, okay. E right. So I don't know if you can actually one more. see my. Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah. It's okay. got the Tacoma so Park. So you see the Tacoma Piney Branch local right park there, and then that unlabeled rectangular area is the city's uh, municipal dog park. Can. Can you walk, now I, I walked around the park and there's some play equipment in there and there's, um, there's one kid and a mother was, was using the park when I was there. Can you go from the back of the park into the Tacoma uh, Branch Local Park? You cannot, uh, at least not in any I didn't think formal so. way. It's, it's fenced it on fenced all in. three sides and there's a very steep slope that is, you know, very overgrown, undeveloped uh, parkland. Um, so no, I don't think you could walk between the two. Um, would that be something that, that the, would be a recommendation to open this up so that you can go from one park to the other park? No. Melissa, would you like to speak to that? No? <laughs> this is Rebecca Ballow for the record. As part of the designation process, no, you cannot make that recommendation. <laughs> the, the commission as a whole can certainly send comments about the historic preservation recommendations. That's appropriate. If you have comments as individuals about other aspects of the plan, that may be appropriate for you to send those individually to the board, but not necessarily as your role as historic preservation commissioners. If you would like more information about the disposition of the local park, I think our division chief, Elza Heisel-McCoy, could answer them. But really, in your role as commissioners, no. You, I would recommend that you not. OK. OK. And I had um, one other comment, I guess. Um, comment or question? Comment. No, questions at this point. Questions. Questions at this point. All right, I'll wait for comments then. I would like to respond to your initial question about the, the site and sort of the architecture of the building. I think the very, you know, sort of plainness and, and small nature of the site that you describe are very reflective of this history. I mean, it was a very, there was very little funding set aside for this site. It required years of activism by the city's black residents to acquire any recreation land. And the fact that such a small site and a very plain, um, unassuming building building were created for them is a reflection of the, the racial um, discrimination that existed at the time of its construction. So I think those features you describe are part of the site's integrity and help tell that story of segregation. A John Lee versus Story Preservation staff. I just want to respond to one other uh, comment in terms of the period significance. So for periods of significance, it can be a singular point of year, it could be a singular year, it could be a range of years that really doesn't add to or lessen the significance of a site. Uh, the period's also important is that uh, it gives us the time frame from when additions were put on a building, whether we find those to be historically significant or not. So just because something has a large range of significance or a smaller range, it doesn't really um, lessen or diminish a site's uh, significance. Commissioner Radu. This is Commissioner Radu. Uh, I have a question regarding the uh, materials of the house and what is original and what's not. I mean, I know you mentioned that recently the porch was enclosed. Um, are windows original? Um, I mean, w what is original? It's a mixture. So the the porch 
I mean, if you, the detailed architectural description is in the designation form. So that goes around uh, each elevation of the building and describes it. I would say most of the windows have been uh, replaced. There are some original windows remaining on the west elevation um, of the building um, and on the east elevation here. The entire rear of the structure has been you know, considerably altered. Um, so uh, the windows have been replaced, but the stucco material, uh, we believe the enclosure of the porch to be um, dating from the period of significant of the Cress's residence, um, as well as the, uh, the approach to the porch there, the concrete stairs and pipe rail, um, I think there are the the form and massing of the house are very much as they were, even though um, some of the materials in the fenestration have changed. Thank you. Well, I actually I'm glad you answered that, but I, I think I'm maybe said wrong. But I was asking about this uh, Hafner part. Oh, okay. House. You said house, and so I thought the house. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So for Hafner. Let's see here. So the, uh, very much the same here. So the window, the fenestration patterns have been changed slightly. You can see here on the west elevation um, where there's sort of the ghost of windows that used to exist. So those have been changed slightly um, as, as, along with some on the, the, uh, the north elevation. Um, we did not feel that those, you know, greatly impacted the, the sort of look and feel of the building. Um, but yes, most of, I think, all of the original windows and, and doors have been replaced at this point. Um, so there are, there is at least one steel door here on the west elevation. It's hard to say whether that's original or not. Um, but it's not the modern um, composite material that you see on the, the south and the north elevations. Thank you. Any other questions? Commissioner uh, Dominiani, do I have that right? Yes. Am I, am I close? Yes, Commissioner Dominiani. <laughs> thank yeah. you. It's thank a tough you. one, yeah. I wanted to thank you very much for the presentations. I thought they were great. I have a question about uh, Crestview in particular. Okay. I noted uh, on my trip past the site that it is pretty complicated in the way that it's built out with terraced gardens and the garage and I think remnants of, um, of a water storage unit of some kind and other things, but I was hoping you could speak to the crenellated wall that's along uh, Carroll Avenue there and whether that is, uh, or is it Maple Avenue? Carroll. Carroll Avenue, yes. And if the crenellated wall was also uh, going to be protected in the same way as the terraced gardens would. I know that the garage had undergone some pretty significant changes over the years and um, doesn't really look the way that it used to, but I was hoping you could speak a little bit to that. Sure. So we have identified the stone retaining wall at the front of the property as a contributing feature. Uh, it is not, the entire length is not included in the property, but uh, parts of it are along the front of the house there. That is included within the, the private property. Um, so that is part of the proposed environmental setting and would be a protected feature were this to be designated. Um, this wall dates to about 1932 when the Carroll Avenue Bridge was replaced and they did some work to, um, to realign Carroll Avenue at that time. And this wall was built at that point and replaced an, an uh, earlier sort of low concrete wall that existed. So it's definitely a feature that dates to the period of significance, was built when the Cresses lived there and would certainly be something we would um, identify to be protected in a master plan designation. Thank you. Commissioner Burdett. I just uh, want to confirm, I guess, that the Crestview is not covered under the Tacoma Park Historic District, so therefore any changes to it would not have come forward to the HPC for a hop or anything like that. That is correct. The, the Tacoma Park Historic District does reach out and have a little arm that captures the Carroll Avenue Bridge, but that's the furthest extent of it, and it does not include uh, this property. So that's correct. They would have never come um, to the commission previously for a hop or any other review. Um, and regarding the Hefner Center, um, you mentioned in your, your report that at the time the hilltop neighborhood was um, maybe not predominantly African-American, but heavily residential for African-Americans. Is What is its com composition now for, do you know? We're conferring. <laughs> Just 
just to confirm, Rebecca Ballo, for the record, are you asking for the present day yeah. demographics and the sort of disposition of the architecture or what it was historically when the Hefner Community Center I, was built? I guess the current day demographic uh, 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 residents sure. themselves. We don't have that information okay. available. Thank you. Any other questions? Nope. No, no, we're gonna, we'll have, we're, we're, we will have, we, okay, let me just, let me outline what we're doing here. Staff report, questions of staff, public, questions of public, then we will have our deliberations, at which time you can give me your comments, and we will move on, hopefully, to a process where we recommend that these properties be sent on, okay? Um, thank you. Um, if there are no more questions, I just would like to uh, say that I think you did a fantastic job, all of you. It's just a, it's a superb projects, uh, wonderful documentation. It's just really first class. So thank you so much, both of you. And at this point, we'll move on to uh, public comment. I have one named Susan Schreiber, but before I call you, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, is there anyone here from any of the properties that we are considering <clears throat> whom we do not have a name or a tag for? Okay, thank you. Ms. Shriver, if you could come forward. Um, I'm sorry? Oh, yes. I'm sorry, yes. Yes, this is Mr. Jeffrey Brokaw. He's the owner of Crestview. Um, okay. Prior to the meeting, he indicated that he did not wish to. You do not sign wish to speak? speak. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. If you'd like to come forward and and uh, we, if you want to say anything, we'd we'd love to have you. If not, that's fine too. Whatever your preference. Okay, thank you. Okay. Ms. Schreiber, um, if you could um, turn on your microphone there, turn on the button, when it turn, the light turns on, there you'll be is. good to go. Good. And if you could, if you could uh, state your name yes. for the record, and you will have five minutes. Thank you. And then if you could stay there to answer questions, we would appreciate that as well. Thank sure. you. Thank you very much. I've dispensed with my written notes. Um, a lot of things were covered very beautifully in... Um, Casey Rowan's presentation. Um, my name is Susan Schreiber. I'm a resident of Tacoma Park for many years, and I'm here representing historic Tacoma, which is incorporated both in Maryland and actually in, um, in the district as well. Look, and, but, um, and I don't know if you're that familiar with historic Tacoma. It has quite extensive archives. And um, it was actually the planning department over the last year that um, identified a photograph of um, the Rosenwald-funded school on Geneva Avenue, which was open from 1928 to 55, um, which we did not have a copy of. And it was wonderful to be able to hand it to several people and say, yes, there's our school. Um, we had a couple of photographs of teacher and kids standing outside of a building, but you couldn't see the building as a whole. Um, I'm, I'm representing um, uh, the Board of Historic Tacoma and also the project team for the um, African American Oral History Project, which we initiated, uh, I think, three and a half years ago, and began by um, identifying and conducting pretty extensive oral history interviews with about 15 individuals. Um, you did ask some questions about the neighborhood. And in fact, um, the hill was, there were two primary neighborhoods. And the hill was the largest. Um, and uh, the whole life of the black community um, it, across the city really was centered at the church, at, Parker Memorial Baptist Church, which subsequently burned, was rebuilt, et cetera, and uh, the Geneva Avenue, um, Tacoma Park, um, first through sixth grade uh, schools. So those really were the center of the community. Um, the other neighborhood, the other primary neighborhood, there was the hill and the bottom. And the bottom is down along Sligo Creek. Um, it's smaller. 
its two streets, essentially Colby and Cherry, and um, people who, it's actually somewhat intact in terms of in terms of family connections, old family connections. And um, there are several houses there that were, uh, while the hill was developed with streets um, in a much more um, uh, systematic way, um, the bottom people, you know, one woman told us that she, her family brought um, all of their belongings in a boxcar from the south um, and deposited them. And, um, people in that neighborhood had to cut down trees and create um, a landscape that could be built on. They really started from nothing. Um, today, the hill is significantly changing. After all, it's not in the historic district. And some of you have driven up um, along Ritchie Avenue, um, particularly, um, and Geneva are seeing um, some really large contemporary houses being built in the mixed uh, in the midst of small um, brick houses and um, and frame houses. The frame houses, most of those are on and the bottom, but um, it is rapidly changing. And um, the saving grace is that the community um, there's a diaspora of people who still feel very connected to um, their old, um, the, the black community in Tacoma Park. And um, although it stopped during COVID, they are going, I don't think they're going to do it this year, but they will start up again. Every June, there is a, um, a, a picnic, a gathering of people, some of whom come from North Carolina and South Carolina, um, Virginia, and people who were just settled all over, you know, this, the greater Montgomery County and probably PG County areas. And they come together. And that's how we met a number of the people um, who, whom we interviewed. That was sort of the beginnings. Um, a central person on our team has been Patricia Matthews, who is Lee Jordan's daughter, and um, has lived her whole life um, in the, on the Ritchie Avenue, in the Ritchie Avenue neighborhood, um, and has become a really just central community member for us. And we had a a team of community advisors, um, three of whom had attended um, the Tacoma Park School. Um, I want to say a word about the building itself, the Hefner Building. Um, when it was built, um, you know, as Casey Rowan has reported, um, there was already a sizable recreation building. And on Saturday nights, the um, black students couldn't go to it. Uh, um, black kids couldn't couldn't participate, but they'd go out and stand in the parking lot and dance to the music. Um, when um, Hefner was when the building was built, and and uh, Lee Jordan worked very hard. There was also a leader in the down in the bottom, Daniel Lewis, who was also involved in a number of these campaigns. But um, once the city closed down the playground and and put moved. Public Works mis moved the trash facility there because the people on Maple Avenue didn't like it because it was smelly and obnoxious. And of course, they located it right in the middle of the black community. When the playground was shut down, that gave Jordan even more sort of this, he really refocused again on, on having a community center. And when the building was built, this small um, cinder block building, it's not that everybody thought this is wonderful. Um, one person who um, is in her 80s remembers, she said, when I first saw that building, when my sisters and I first saw it, it was so small and dismal, we didn't even want to go inside. If you could move your comments on to, to a conclusion, we oh, appreciate it. Oh, pardon me. Thank you. I've got to, oh, I'm sorry <laughs> about the five minutes. I beg your pardon. That's fine. We'll give um, you a little bit what longer. I, what I'm so... I, I shouldn't spin all of that. What I, what I did want to say, and the reason I'm here, is how much we appreciate these in-depth narratives about all three sites, particularly about Hefner. And um, what I, I do want to say about it, it's the, you may sometimes think, why do we do all this? Is anybody paying attention? Well, these narratives, this narrative of the Hefner building as 
um, a way of talking about the whole history of the black community in the 20th century in Tacoma Park is tremendously valuable. And um, we are going to be um, sending it out to educators um, across the county. Um, and of course, I mean, with kids in Tacoma Park are attending, of course, county schools. I just wanted to make a note and say um, one of the things that we did was produce a film, which is referred to in the footnotes of the report, um, and it's called, um, they called him Mr. Lee, and if you haven't seen it, it's a 32-minute film, and it, it's, it's very, you know, I think very effective, and uh, we're, we're proud of it. Um, and I wanted just to share with you a comment. I had sent the film to uh, Tracy Gray Oliver, who's the superintendent for K through 12 social studies, uh, about six months ago. And she saw, watched it right away and she responded the next day and said, one of our goals in social studies is to help students become change makers. Mr. Lee's commitment to social action is a fantastic example of what it needs to be a change maker. And then she goes on to talk about the film and, and the background that these narratives will provide, I think, for teachers is going to be really significant. Um, uh, because then she goes on to talk about the film as being relevant for um, introducing um, particularly segregated recreational facilities, which they start to talk about with kids in the fifth grade. And in the ninth grade, um, where um, segregation is a major part of the of the ninth grade curriculum. Thank you very much. So at any rate, thank you. Um, I'm sorry right. to go on at such oh, that's, length, that's but we, quite just, all right. we you, appreciate you, your work. Any questions for Ms. Schreiber? I have one Commissioner Doman. Do you live in, in the area around there? I do, I do. Do you live on the hill or? I don't. And I know that I'm not supposed to squeeze this in, um, <laughs> Chairman Sutton, but one of the, what, just remember that you're answering um, questions now, so oh, you're good. off the clock. Okay, let me say, I don't live on the hill um, or in the bottom. Um, and one of the things that people should be aware of is that there was a lot of redlining. And so it's not as though African Americans could move any place they wanted to in Tacoma Park. And that area up around the hill was, had, was a place where people could move to. Thank you very much. Okay, I think at this point we will start our deliberations. Um, and I suppose at any point here, I think it's not normally what we would do, but if you have any questions, additional questions for staff, I think that would be appropriate. But um, I, would, I think I would like to kick this one off. Um, I personally think that the um, Hefner Park Community Center is one of the most important sites that I have seen since I have been on this commission, and the reason is it's not an elegant, beautiful building as we've noted. I think the thing that's so important about this, it really, really tells people about the history of our county. And part of our history is not a beautiful history, and I think a building that is not particularly beautiful, that talks about our history that is not particularly beautiful in that period, but it's beginning to change, and so it really does two things. I think it does, it tells us um, about the, this, our past in the county and how it's beginning to change into the future, and I think this building really captures those two, those two things. But more than that, I think it follows our criteria that, we've, that we, is important for us to follow for designating historic properties. Um, I also, the, the two buildings, the house, the Crest House and the um, Adventist Church, I think these are, are also really pretty amazing properties. Uh, I think they're, I think especially the church is really a quite elegant um, ecclesiastical building, um, and that's uh, very important, I think, for the community. But I think uh, the, the uh, history of the Adventist church in the area, I think it's, it's very important, and I think um, th these two buildings uh, really help to capture that, and also it meets our they both meet our criteria for uh, designation. And I will shut up. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, Commissioner Rod. Uh, excuse me, Commissioner Nasser. Nasser, um, both of you, thank you so much. I live in that neighborhood, and it's embarrassing that I did not know about the Hefner 
um, house, uh, which kind of shows that we definitely need to make this designation. <laughs> I mean, I kind of know about Mr. Lee and some of the history, but I did not know about, about this uh, particular building. Um, and as I don't want to repeat, but uh, I guess in this case, the lack of um, kind of uh, architectural significance is kind of the historic significance, and it's uh, very important to uh, record, document, and um, keep and preserve these buildings. Um, same thing with the others. I fully support all three designations. Once again, thank you so much. It was very informative and uh, nice presentation. Commissioner Burdett. Um, I also want to thank you for really amazing uh, documentation and a recommendation in the staff report. Um, I find all three of these properties significant and each in their own way. Um, the church, of course, is, a, is an outstanding example of modern, uh, the modern style of Art Deco. Um, and we have, do not have a great amount of it in the county. Um, and to save one is significant. Um, the Crestview House also, I, you know, we see a lot of Tacoma houses come through here. Um, so a little bungalow, okay, that's nice. Um, but the fact that it was the residence of the second woman surgeon in the county is really significant. I mean, the, the fact that she and her husband both were outstanding members of the community, trail breakers of their time, I think that is definitely worth uh, noting in the designation of this house. And then the Hefner Rec Center, as a person who grew up in Montgomery County, I can completely relate to the rather utilitarian uh, uh, nature of all the rec centers in the county. They're there for you know, tough use by a lot of little kids all year round. Um, and the fact that they're kind of minimal is, that's just part of the, the aspect of those buildings. And this one comes with a significant cultural uh, standing and impact. So I support all three of these for their designations. Thank you. Commissioner Doman. Okay. Now you can have your comments. <laughs> um, I, I guess I feel a little bit different. I have no problem with any three of these particular properties. I just, um, I don't know, I, I can't get excited about the Hefner building. I understand what uh, Commissioner Sutton says, and I understand the significance of it. I just think sometimes we're saving more things than we need to save sometimes. But my, my one comment I'd like to see, I don't know if this is, something that would carry very far, but the building is named after Herman Hefner, and one of the criteria was um, people of significance, and I just thought that he should also be included in one of the criterias as being a significant person, because he, he was instrumental. You have uh, a little write-up in here that he was the leader, he was on the uh, Tacoma Park Council for 10 years, and he was instrumental in bringing this before the council to get to get the building built. Now, whether or not it's a, it's a big deal or not, but I, I would just like to see him men mentioned also in your criteria um, as being a part of the significance of this building. That, I mean, not everybody is a racist. I mean, I think he was, of uh, that time, he was trying to move ahead and trying to make this thing better, and I think he should be recognized for some of the work that he did on it. And I'd like to say, on the walking, uh, the 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 stone, um, uh, what do you call it? The uh, along, along Carroll Avenue, Avenue, all that stone that goes on. I think that's really attractive, and and I assume underneath your under your write up, that's going to be preserved. And across the street, there's um, um, a display talking about the bridge, uh, Sligo Creek Bridge. It shows the original bridge. The earlier, the later bridge, and then the final bridge on the thing. So, uh, I think those are important that you can put those things up. And you said that that bridge is part of the historic district. I guess is that correct? Yes, it is. 
Yeah. It is already part of the historic yeah. district. So I think um, signs like that, maybe if something goes in front of the, um, the Sligo Church or in front of the Crest House, something like that, I think signage like that is important because I did walk down, I did take the time to see that, and I did read all that, so I thought that was very helpful. So thank you. I believe, I believe sure. that, uh, I'm sorry, if I can just comment here, uh, I, I don't know if it would be helpful or not, but I, I believe that the third request that you have for further study and further um, analysis of the area, that could be included in that, is that, would that be correct? We do have a recommendation included for further interpretive signage, so right. absolutely. Okay. Yes. Thank and you. I would like to speak to sure, the, the comments about Hefner Park as well. Um, so, you know, the the park is already named for Herman Hefner, so he's gaining a you know significant uh, amount of recognition there already. Um, and the the focus of of this effort and the the history of this park is really related to the uh, African American community's efforts to. Uh, achieve their own, um, you know, sort of self-help and community resources. Um, they were really having to advocate for themselves and to fight for almost 20 years to obtain this building. So um, while uh, Council Member Hefner, the park is named in his honor, he is described in the report. Uh, I don't think he rises to the same level of significance as Lee Jordan, who spearheaded this effort for, for decades to achieve this facility. Any other comments? Commissioner Galway. Commissioner Galway. Um, I would also like to echo, you know, a big shout out to the staff for a very comprehensive and, and thorough report. Uh, it was very well done, and, and so thank you. I think far too often we forget that historic preservation and is, is more than just a, a beautiful building. And I think in this case, Hefner Park building and the building itself is a beautiful building for the reasons that it stands and, and why I, how it was built and why it was built and so I think from from my perspective I you know yes it may not be the most attractive building but it's it it's a it stands as a testament or a monument to to historic preservation not just the architectural preservation of a building so thank you very much for bringing that out in the report thank you Anyone else? Okay, thank you. At this point, um, I believe we can start our, um, is there, does anyone, would anyone like to make a motion <laughs> for this property? First of all, any other questions, any other comments before we move on? Are we doing okay here? <laughs> you guys got it, you're doing good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, I would, I would uh, welcome a motion or several motions um, on these projects. I would, this is Commissioner Burdett, I would like to make the motion, um, if you'll bear with me. Um, the, I make the motion that the Historic Preservation Commission recommends that the Planning Board list the three subject properties in the Locational Atlas and Index of Historic Sites and for the master plan for historic preservation, including the Hefner Park Community Center on 42 Oswego Avenue, Silver Spring, the Crest View at 7625 Carroll Avenue, Tacoma Park, and the Sligo Seventh Day Adventist Church at 7700 Carroll Avenue, Tacoma Park, and that the Historic Preservation Commission transmits comments regarding further staff recommendations in the plan for consideration by the Planning Board and County Council. Do I have a second? This is Commissioner Haynes. I'll second. Thank you. I think what I would like to do, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think what I'd like to do is uh, separate out. <laughs> we have a, we have, nope. or we can vote on. I don't know. Is it? I, I, we have one motion. Um, I don't know it, whether it's appropriate for us to look at all of them together or to separate them out. Thank you, Chair Sutton. The if you could give us a a, a reading from the, from our the guidance, that would be. That would be good. The HPC's rules, guidelines, and procedures 
when it talks about the recommendation, at the close of either the public appearance or a work session, the commission will formulate its recommendation on each proposed nomination. Okay. This recommendation may be put to a vote and decided by a majority of commissioners. So I think I would recommend if, if the commission one. take okay. a vote on each one individually. Now, should we... Should I think we could do this if I ask for a vote on each one. Does, does the motion be? need to be revised? No, I think the motion is, I think, is I think fine. The you, fine. Okay. you might you might add um, whether or not you might add um, you know in accordance with the staff recommendation regarding the applicable designation criteria with the environmental settings recommended by the staff. If you're so inclined to take up the staff <laughs> recommendation, but I think referencing the designation criteria in um, 24A and noting the environmental settings as part of your motion. Do one for each one, we're clear, we're clean. Okay. Um, <laughs> we're gonna, okay, I, I we're gonna think do one for each one. I, I would recommend that we, that you withdraw your your uh, <laughs> motion, <laughs> and if your second will withdraw his as well, I think it might be cleaner if we if we do each of these four, three properties, and the fourth item on transmitting separately. I think we might be a little bit cleaner. I don't think we would have any problem in the future if that's if that's acceptable to you and your second. I withdraw my motion. And we will rephrase it. This Commissioner Haynes, I withdraw my second. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, bear with me while I get this right. Um, okay. I make a motion that the Historic Preservation Commission recommends that the planning board list the Hefner Park Community Center addressed. 42 Oswego Avenue, Silver Spring, but in Tacoma Park proper, um, that it uh, doesn't, let's see, it lists the, the property on the locational atlas and index of historic sites, and also uh, the property should be designated in the master plan for historic preservation based on staff recommendations that the property meets the criteria of 24A and B, and, what am I missing? Perfect. Um, I'm missing something. I don't think so. The environmental, and the environmental setting. And the environmental setting, thank you. Uh, do the next one? Nope, no, Okay, no, I need a second. No, no. This is Commissioner Haynes, I'll second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? It's Commissioner Doman, I abstain. Thank you. We have seven in favor and one abstention. Okay. On to the next. Next. Um, I make a motion that the Historic Preservation Commission recommends that the planning board list the Crestview House at 7625 Carroll Avenue, Tacoma Park on in the locational atlas and index of historic sites as well as designated in the master plan for historic preservation um, based on the staff's recommendations that the, the property meets the criteria in chapter 24A and B and that the Historic Preservation Commission transmits, uh, no, and, and the environmental setting. Thank you. Ms. Commissioner Haynes, I'll second that motion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Thank you. Seven four, none against, and none abstain. Number three, um, I make the motion that the Historic Preservation Commission recommends that the planning board list the Sligo Seventh-day Adventist Church at 7700 Carroll Avenue, Tacoma Park, um, in the locational atlas and index of historic sites, and also recommend that the county council, that, the, that it be designated in the master plan for historic preservation 
based on the staff's recommendations, the property meets the criteria um, in Chapter 24A and B, and along with its environmental setting. So Commissioner Haynes, I'll second the motion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. I'm sorry, all, all ayes in favor? I think I got it. <laughs> Opposed? Abstain? Thank you. This passes seven to nothing. And thank you so much, it's eight all nothing. of you, for doing this. We've got one more, I think. No. Oh. Yes, it's item number more. number uh, three item number on three. the screen. <laughs> and I make a motion that the Historic Preservation Commission transmits comments regarding further staff recommendations in the plan for consideration by the Planning Board and County Council. As Commissioner Haynes, I'll second that motion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Thank you. This passes as well. And again, thank you so much for the, for the really, I think, outstanding work and the outstanding properties you brought to us. And I just, one thing I just, I, I just want to make a, a comment. And I saw the interior of the church, and boy, I wish we could designate the interiors. <laughs> it is really quite an elegant, elegant building. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Okay. Next item on our agenda is number 2C. Um, and before we get to that, I need to do a little, a little homework here. First of all, have all these properties been duly uh, uh, advertised? Yes, Chair Sutton. The hops were advertised in the April 26th edition of the Washington Times. Thank you. And is there anybody to speak in favor or in opposition to item number 2C at 7600 Needwood Road in Durwood? Mr. Chair, hearing no objections, I move that we approve the following historic area work permit in accordance with the staff reports based upon the record before us and in consideration of the recommendations of the local advisory panels including any conditions recommended by staff. Hop number 1028557 at 6700 Needwood Road, Durwood. Ms. Commissioner Haynes, I'll second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain, thank you. This, this uh, was approved very easily. The next item on our agenda is a preliminary consultation, not item number 3A, at 3929 Washington Avenue in Kensington. Is there a staff report? Uh, yes, there is, Mr. Chair. This will be a brief staff presentation on the preliminary consultation, 3929 Washington Street in Kensington, which is the building in front of you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, because there weren't enough seats, I didn't introduce myself earlier. Uh, Dan Bruckert, staff, for the record. Thank you. Uh, the subject property was constructed circa 1953 with a post-1966 uh, addition on the left side. It's listed as a secondary resource to the Kensington Historic District, which is the equivalent of a non-contributing resource. And the proposal is to demolish the current building and construct a new single-family house on the lot. Um, just to sort of familiarize yourself with, with Kensington and its background, because we're talking about appropriate infill construction, it was... Um, developed in the late 1880s uh, as a garden suburb away from the city. So most of the late 19th and early 20th century styles are represented, uh, including Queen Anne and shingle style and colonial revival. Um, and this is what Kensington looked like in about 1902. This is actually Washington Street in 1902, according to the, the caption in our records. Uh, this should be reviewed under Chapter 24A, the Kensington Master Plan Amendment, including, including the vision of Kensington. Uh, select excerpts of that were included in the staff report. The Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation and primarily Standards 2, 9, and 10. So for those of you who weren't able to do a site visit, you can familiarize yourself with the property. It's a ranch. Uh, you see from our 1966 Sanborn map that the subject property looked like it was a square uh, or, or a slight rectangle. Obviously, the, the left side addition was added sometime after that. 
On the lower right, you see the, um, the small courtyard. Um, these two trees are something we'll discuss a little bit later. Um, so the applicant presented two options. Uh, the design of the house is virtually identical for, for both of them except for the, the left elevation. Um, what you see in option one includes a breezeway with an attached garage, and then option two is a, a detached garage um, set back from, from the rear wall plane of the building. So just, we can run through these real quickly. Um, so this is the left side elevation, which obviously varies depending on whether or not the attached garage is on it or, or is excluded. Um, the rear elevation, there is some change in grade in the, 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 uh, the lot. So staff finds the existing ranch house does not contribute to the character of the district or the streetscape and may be demolished when considered as part of a new house construction. Um, because Kensington doesn't direct the HPC to allow demolition of secondary resources, staff finds a standalone demolition would be detrimental to the character of the streetscape, uh, which is the requirement for 24A8D, yeah, 24A8D, um, which, directs the HPC to be lenient in their determination. So um, staff supports the demolition as part of an uh, approvable hop for an infill construction. So staff identified six infill houses in, in doing research for this uh, that were approved by the HPC since the district was established. Uh, we eliminated large additions and uh, anything that was in response to sort of catastrophic fire damage because the building was still there. Uh, those six buildings are sort of shown here as a, just to give you a, an idea of what the HPC has previously determined to be appropriate in the Kensington Historic District. These two houses are right next to one another on Baltimore Avenue, and then two more. They're all on the, actually on the, the west side of Connecticut Avenue. Um, and these houses range from, uh, the smallest is, is just under 1,500 square feet for the one that you see on the lower right corner to um, 36, well, almost 3,700 feet for 3,905 Prospect Street. So staff finds that the architectural style and decoration appear to be compatible with the district's Victorian era development. Specific elements such as the wall dormers help create a design that is distinctly contemporary, satisfying the requirements of standard nine. Staff finds that the proposed house mass does not overwhelm the character of the site or the surrounding district. Uh, two trees, um, which is a twin trunk or a tri-trunk spruce, and a multi-trunk magnolia would be removed as part of option two because of the placement of the, um, the detached garage, if that is the option identified uh, by the HPC. Um, trees are something that Kensington, uh, the local advisory panel, um, and, and as a garden suburb are sort of significant to the landscape of the district. And um, they've made that a, a, something that they want to see retained to the greatest extent possible. So we would need to talk about what sort of mitigation would be appropriate and if those two trees were to be lost. Uh, staff does not find that the proposal with the front loading attached garage is compatible with the surrounding district. Staff was only able to identify two instances of attached front loading garages in the district. Both were identified as secondary resources that weren't reviewed by the HPC when they were constructed. Staff additionally finds that the attached garage effectively widens the house to 81 feet, which is nearly the widest house on the street. Actually, the, the house across the street, which was a ranch and has been added onto, is actually 84 feet wide. Um, and that is the widest house by a significant degree. Uh, staff finds that the attached garage behind the proposed house or revising the design to include an attached side or rear loading garage are preferable site layouts. So there are, are two pages of, of prompts for the HPC this evening as to sort of guide the discussion. Uh, does the HPC concur that demolishing the resource will not detract from the character of the district? Does the HPC concur with staff's finding that the design and materials proposed are appropriate for the district? Um, whether the HPC finds that the right side elevation requires modification to the fenestration to be compatible with the overall design or, um, and, and the applicant may clear this up, is the drawing intended to be purely illustrative at this point? I think there is one window that's actually missing in the, the elevation drawing 
Um, but I may be reading that wrong as it's blown up. Um, does the HPC concur with staff's finding that the attached front-facing garage is incompatible with the character of the Kensington Historic District? Uh, whether the proposed location for the detached garage is appropriate, and if so, is any mit mitigation required for the loss of those two trees? And whether any additional information, like a detailed landscape plan, a streetscapes could study, uh, as-built drawings is required with the HOP application and any other comments that the HPC has. And I will be happy to answer any questions that you have at this time. Any questions? Commissioner Burdett. Um, regarding the two trees that are up for discussion, the House dates to um, some point in the last 50 years, give or take? Uh, 70. Um, 70, I mean. And, and then we, do, we don't have, I mean, I don't have an exact date or, or even a better date than post 19, between 1966 and 1986. For okay. the addition. For the addition. So the assumption would be since they're multi trunk and fairly small that the trees are not of a significant age. Um, so. Well, that would be a determination that you would make. make. Okay. So it, that is part of the mitigation that we will be discussing. Yes. Of. And, and so uh, again, it's the, this, this spruce, um, which I think is actually this one or this is part of it, and then this magnolia, which is not terribly wide. Uh, the applicant provided a um, full site plan, uh, and so this is 14 inches. The magnolia is 14 inches as it, at its widest point. Thank you. Commissioner Doman. It's Commissioner Doman. Did we receive a report from the uh, local advisory committee on this particular property? Yes, and I believe that it was uploaded to the commission's board book. I must have missed it. Okay. Any 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 significant comments from them? Um, I mean, they were they were generally supportive of the project. Um, the commission the the. LAP members provided comments individually rather than speaking with a singular voice. Um, most voices supported the detached, a detached garage configuration. Um, and I, I think that was the sort of the, the majority opinion um, and, and the primary thing to take away from that. Uh, but two of the panel members did stress the, the importance of maintaining a, a diverse tree canopy in the district. Then can I see the Commissioner Nasser? Commissioner Nasser, can I see the site plan, please, for a second? Do you want the? I, I just want to see if there are any topo lines on the other site oh, plan. Oh, uh, so th there are on on this one. This was done by um, a civil engineering firm, so okay. they they're not terribly clear in the way that it's presented here. But we do have topo lines, and I think the um, the project architect could speak to how. Significantly, the, the grade drops off. The back. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner Galway. Commissioner Galway, I, w I need a little clarity. You you mentioned that the garage, the attached garage, may not be characteristic of the neighborhood, and then you said something about side loading. Is it the fact that the the home itself becomes awfully wide that is not characteristic, or is it the fact that it's a front-loaded garage versus a side-loaded, and would the side-loaded be something that would be more um, <coughs> more characteristic of the, of the neighborhood? Well, so I think with a, with a side-loading garage that's in the rear, it would be less visible from the public right-of-way. So I think um, with the, the option that you see in front of you, we find that this both creates a a very wide house that's um, wider than what's characteristic of the district, but also um, what you see in Kensington's historical development is you had, um, you know, you, you had um, all of the the accessory structures were located to the rear of the building, so you would have had um, any of those buildings were were tucked back there. So a, a garage this close to the house is not. I mean, it's, it's lower, um, but it's still not subservient to the, the house to quite the same degree. So, you know, what you see in most of the houses in Kensington are detached garages in the rear, which are front-loading. You can see them, but they're also 50 feet back from the right-of-way. 
So it's, it's that development pattern that we think is, is more appropriate for the character of the district. Now, uh, the house across the street has, you know, if you were to take this garage and place it here um, and have it side load, that would be um, something that staff would, would entertain because it's less visible from the right of way. And uh, the mass of that space is largely obscured behind the rest of the, the house mass. Okay, so just as a follow-up question or a question, you were not suggesting that if you shifted the home and somehow it doesn't look at, like it would be appropriate because of the setbacks or are capable because of the setbacks of having a side loaded that wasn't detached. That's not what you were we were talking about then. So you're uh, side loaded if it was detached and pushed back behind. Well, or I mean side loaded or. I mean, I, we, I think that, I mean, again, we haven't seen a design proposal right. like that, so this is sort of a maybe think about um, doing this. But if the, it was an attached garage, but it was attached to the rear of the house, you could then make it side-loading, gotcha. um, yeah. which several of the other houses have taken, ha have done. Um, and, and again, because that garage mass is behind the, the house, it is largely obscured from the right of way and you can't see until you're right on top of it. I understand, thank you. Any other questions for staff? If not, I would invite. Um, I unfortunately do not have your names here, so I, uh, if you could, if you could uh, identify yourselves, give your name, um, and then you'll have uh, seven minutes. Sure. Your name and, I suppose one of you is the owner and the other is the architect. Is that? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Luke Olson, you. GTM Architects. Yeah, Tom McCullough. Thank you. Um, in general, we're here to just get a sense of which option you prefer. Um, we think both works for the lot. Uh, we generally agree with the staff report. There are a couple of items that I just want to comment on. That right side elevation. Um, we don't necessarily agree that it's not laid out in a fashion that's not designed. We've paired the windows around the chimney and then mirrored that to the other side, put a window in the center, and then put a triple window centered on the gable above. And so it has a symmetry to it within the asymmetry, and that's kind of typical of a shingle-style house. They don't have to be perfectly symmetrical, and I think that's perfectly fine, especially for a secondary elevation. Not saying that this one isn't important or it doesn't look good in itself, but it doesn't have to have the, the perfectly symmetrical layout of, let's say, a federal or colonial style home. Um, there was a, a mention of providing as-built drawings in the staff report um, on a structure like this where the existing resource isn't actually of any historic value. We just don't see the, the necessity for it. We've never been required to do it before. We've had to demo a house that's non-contributing and build a new house. It's a lot of effort and cost to document something that could probably be handled with photos and we're happy to just take really good photos of everything on the lot and provide those for the record. There's also the site plan that's already there that documents the footprint massing location of the house. Um, in terms of the two options that we've presented, we, we do recognize that an attached garage is atypical. It's not something that is the norm in the historic district that usually you have a detached garage. But there are a few different reasons that in this specific circumstance, we thought you might consider an attached garage. Um, the first being that the existing garage is not in a really great location for the lot in terms of functionality. Um, it's kind of crammed in between the trees. It's tucked behind the house, rather tight, where it's really hard to get in and out. Uh, it blocks most of the rear yard and the use and enjoyment of the property. It's back there where it increases the amount of um, impervious area that's required to get to it. And um, I suspect that part of the reason that it's in the condition that it's in, which is a little bit dilapidated, is because it's hard to use and so it wasn't a priority. It wasn't actually used on a day-to-day -day basis in its current location. Um, and in fact, if we were to attach the garage as shown in option one, we'd reduce impervious square footage on the lot by about 110 square feet. Uh, more so if we also look at um, permeable pavers or some other features to um, increase permeability and i um, happy to look at that as a part of this application. Um, our clients also expressed their desire to retain as many of the mature trees on the lot as possible. We know that's important, but it's also a character-defining feature of the district and this property in general. There's 12 trees that are above um, six-inch DBH, 
and um, several of them are rather large. There's also a couple of right-of-way trees and a tree on the property line, so there's significant tree cover, um, particularly the magnolia that's back by the garage. Uh, the, the clients really would like to retain that one, and so to the extent possible, moving that garage forward and attaching it to the house made a lot of sense. Um, the third reason would be that it clearly differentiates this house as non-historic in a very simple fashion that this doesn't exist in historic properties in the district. It's only secondary resources, as staff mentioned, that have this feature. And so you'd be able to walk down the street and say, that's a new house that wasn't original and contributing. They wouldn't do this. Um, now, to be said that we've also tried to work the design so that it doesn't look like most attached to car garages. We've located it in such a fashion that uh, maybe it was detached and then later connected as a part of that right side addition later on as you kind of see development of properties in the district. Um, and then the fourth reason is accessibility. Our clients are um, a little bit older and would just like the comfort and ease of use of having an attached garage. Um, and for all the previous reasons, this location for that made the most sense. Um, having said all of that, we have provided an option for a detached garage um, that we'd welcome your thoughts on as well. It does require the removal of two of those trees. We know that's an important issue in the district, uh, and we'd be happy to replant trees as needed to mitigate that tree loss. Um, we do think that there's significant tree canopy, as I've previously mentioned, so that it's, it's not um, something that would detract from the character of the district or the property itself. Um, and with that, I'd just be happy to answer any questions that you have. Any questions? Okay, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, at this point, what we what we will do is we will uh, give you our our recommendations for what we think will make this uh, project approvable as a historic area work permit. And uh, you're not required to take our suggestions. However, <coughs> I think usually they're pretty good, <laughs> and usually uh, the projects are approved uh, that we where you take our recommendations. So um, I will open it up now for um, any. Oh, absolutely. Yes, I'm sorry. So I didn't know we were wrapping up so quick. <laughs> um, so I was wondering, um, is there any give and take here in terms of the two options? Like if option one is not desirable, it's not your first choice. You know, if we used a higher grade of materials, like we were thinking about a cedar shake roof for the main roof of the house and we were thinking about using copper gutters and things like that. So, um, you know, the whole idea of the front-loading <clears throat> garage being not your, you know, your first option, um, I was wondering if there's any give and take in terms of the rest of the house and the design. What, what we typically do, typically do is look at what we're presented in this case. It looks like the major, the major issue that we were presented with is whether to have the garage uh, attached or separate. Right. Um, but we can, often we will also recommend different uh, treatments for the house as well. Although that wasn't presented to us, sometimes we will, we will offer that as well. Okay. Okay. At this point, I Anybody like to start off with a, with a, I got a comment. recommendation? Commissioner Doman? This is just discussion time, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. I, uh, I'm, I'm really um, got mixed feelings on this thing because you could go almost either way. You can make an argument in both cases on here. I did visit the property. I did walk up and down the street, and I did take a look at the streetscape, and there's a wide variety of homes in this area. And I think the thing that stuck out in my mind is directly across the street from your house that we're talking about here is probably the biggest house on, and this is what, Washington, on, on the whole street. This is the, the biggest house right across the street, and, and it looks fairly new, maybe built 10 years, 15 years ago or something. And and I could, I'm not sure if the garage was front opening or side opening. I didn't must be side opening on the garage. I wasn't sure, but um, I, I, like I said, I, I could make it. I could make a case either way on this thing. I think. I think if if the idea is that the people, I, I, you're the homeowner, then if, if 
I mean, there's a definite convenience of having a garage attached to the house. So when it's pouring rain, you don't have to carry your groceries in through the rain. I understand that. And if it was up to me, I might like this um, being attached. Um, but also, the neighborhood generally has garages farther back. So I could, I could argue that case, too. I hate to see trees being removed, but I think you've addressed most of that pretty, pretty well. Um, I think I, I, I could go for the front loading, even primarily because you have something right across the street. Um, that's a very large house, very different from the other houses that are on the, on the block. But this is only a preliminary cons consultation, and uh, I think we all have different opinions on this. So that's kind of where I stand. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Commissioner Burdett. Um, I, the, the issue of a, the front loading detached or the front loading attached garage is, is worth considering this, this house is, that you've proposed, the elevations are quite charming. Um, it would set very well in Greenwich Village, which is another historic district we have, uh, review over. Um, but looking at the plans you've provided on the two options, my first my first thought was you're sticking rather rigorously to the original footprint of the house you're demolishing. And why is that? Could you flip the whole floor plan o over so that you don't impact the trees you're worried about and is it an issue of just the curb cut, getting a new curb cut? It's, it's multiple issues. There are a couple of very large trees on that property line as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so in consulting with an arborist at the start of this project, they said that we generally speaking be best to stick to the same location of the existing house. And um, also, yeah, the curb cut is on the left side. And generally speaking, we like to work within the existing character of the property, work with the existing curb cut keep the driveway and the garage on the same side. Um, it's also kind of a similar breakup of the house with uh, the main mass over on that, that right side where um, we have a little bit more current impact. So it's, it's less likely that we damage trees and get into critical root zones if we build it where we've sited it. Well, that was my other thought was any, any impact around that spruce is going to kill it pretty quickly. Um, and it were, you know, they talk about the drip line, but a tree that old, it's going to be a little bit beyond the drip line and just the construction activity, the trucks. And so could damage that the life of that tree it may not die for a couple of years, but it will die eventually. Um, my take on this would be to uh, go back to your drawing board and try to figure out a floor plan that um, does not have a front-loaded garage, but perhaps has a side-loaded uh, garage off the back of the house. Um, and don't be so fixated on uh, maintaining the existing, uh, replicating the existing footprint, or the footprint of the existing house. People do that all over DC because they are required to, but you don't have a setback issue around here. And I assume you don't have a zoning issue with a house of this size, so. If, excuse me, if you go to the actual CAS engineering plan, you'll see the trees actually, th there's really no other place to put the house. I mean, the, the trees on the right side are right on the property line, and they're much more substantial. And I understand that, and you have property setback lines as well that will prohibit right. pushing the, tr the house that far. I'm just saying, take another look, you know, and think outside the box the existing box, I should say, um, to see what you can find. You've done a very nice elevation and plan, but I think you should look and see if there isn't some other way to do uh, either a side loading or detached garage that can function to the owner's we, requirements we actually, and desires. We actually tried that. I mean, that was our first choice. But Luke, it's not working, right? I mean, there's not enough room. You're saying this in, I'm, instead of option two, you would want a spot that like provides us 
the house that we're looking for, this, this general footprint and scope, and a detached garage, but doesn't involve any tree removal? I, of the two I'm seeing, I would prefer option two simply because it is detached and behind the house, and that is the typical, is typical for that, for Kensington and that community. Um, if you want to save the two trees, I suggest you take another look at this then. Um, but I think the front loading is not preferred. Okay. Is it possible to get a read from the other commissioners? Okay, I'm sorry. I can actually. No, no. I'm sorry. What was your question? Uh, well, I mean, we're hopeful that we can go in and be successful f for the next hearing. So I, I just I didn't know if you were wrapping it up. Oh no, no, not at all. Okay. No. <laughs> okay. Commissioner Haynes. Uh, thank you. Um, um, I concur with uh, Commissioner Burdett's assessment of the uh, the massing. I think the elevations, uh, massing and architecturally, will fit well with with the character of the neighborhood. Um, I think the the massing of the garage as an attached element is is well done for an attached garage. What I'm wondering as kind of a uh, cross between the two schemes is could you push in option one, can you push the garage back, take advantage of the five foot uh, uh, um, offset from the property line as you've done in option two, but push it back a little bit farther, uh, still being attached as much as you could. And then maybe you do a garden wall across the front, like an, a wall extension off the dining room to create sort of an auto court with a masonry uh, a garden wall that uh, becomes part of that front facade. and would visually diminish the garage behind it, even though it would be front loading, um, but farther back from the dining room corner of the house, push back as far as you can, maybe got to squish it in. I don't know how wide that is, that 22 wide or 24 wide, your, your garage? It's about 21 wide. And, 21. Yeah, and once it's attached, it's subject to a 10-foot setback instead of a 5-foot setback. Gotcha. And once we detach it, we'd have to push it into the rear yard. They won't allow us to put it in the front yard. And they're very particular about that. They won't let us do a breezeway because they consider that a connection in terms of being in the rear yard. But if it's on the side, then it isn't a connection. So it's a very specific set of design guidelines that the county's laid out for that. And, and pushing it back any farther or further would require us to remove the trees. Like, we're going to get into the root zone. Well, I mean, you're not going to be able to push it back and, and keep it attached and, and keep the one tree. Um, I'm, I'm kind of open to, to losing one of the trees and working out a deal to plant another tree but i think if if we can if you could push it back far enough you may not i don't know um, um and and instead of it being completely detached just push it back as far as you can from the dining room corner and if you can create sort of an auto court with a garden wall extension across the front that maybe that would uh uh, I think that would extend the front facade, the front plane, as the dominating visual cue, and with the garage in the back, then becomes secondary to the front facade. And I think that could work, as opposed to totally detach, detaching. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Commissioner Galway. Commissioner Galway, uh, I too think that you, the elevation and the massing, you've done a very nice job with, with what you have to work with in, in terms of the site width. Um, I think in some ways, although I would certainly prefer if you could had a blank sheet of paper and you could put the, the garage where you needed to put the garage, I think the detached garage would be my preference, certainly because of the neighborhood and the characteristics. Um, I'm kind of on the fence on this. Um, 
you know, I think that I envision that elevation if it had been the height of your of your right hand roof all the way over and it was this large mass of block it would be really I think unattractive to say the least so I think the way that you've created um, the, the change the elevation and the height of each of the sections of, of the home itself I think it gives it a character that allows me to not be as troubled by by the overall width of the house left to right so um, I think I, based on what I'm seeing today, I could probably support either either option. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Radu. Um, <clears throat> I also um, read the um, notes from the Kensington um, LAP, and it seems like their preferences for a detached garage. And I heard my fellow commissioners. Um, some of them being on the fence, and I also on the fence about um, trying to um, take into account uh, the LAP's recommendations. But I do actually uh, feel that uh, maybe the attached garage is a better um, massing. And I was wondering, uh, I'm a little bit more along, uh, thinking along the lines of Commissioner Haynes, maybe um, if, if you cannot really push the garage to the back, maybe you bring the front of the house, the, that area, the dining area, uh, a little to the front, and then shorten a little bit the, the end of the house, so uh, you don't project obviously below the, uh, below the red line, but, but to, just to have a little more setback, the difference between the front of the house, what's perceived at the front of the house, and the back, uh, and the garage line, and maybe with the with the landscape wall that Commissioner Haynes, I think that would work for me. Thank you. Anyone else? One add. Cut. Well, we're going to get everybody here. Just just one, one one short comment. Um, to add to others' comments, the design of the elevation and the mass is very nice. It's one of the only, like one of the few uh, proposed. Uh, to replace the building that's are actually mm, kind of match the historic district more than the existing. Um, uh, thank you on that. Uh, I don't think you ha you can save the tree that's closer to the house to the house, uh, but the other one it's probably some ways to save the other one. Uh, you could maybe uh, rearrange the garage, bring it to the back, push it push it further back, and there might be actually some ways to attach it in the back to your building. I don't know if it's allowed with some kind of breezeway in the back. You said mm, there's no mm, no connection is allowed. No kind of, even if it's, it's, it's completely in the back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, if you lose that one tree, unfortunately, then there might be ways to actually rearrange the plan um, get your patio, get your garage behind the building and have a side access. I, th I think there are rooms to do that unless I, I, I ask about the um, topo previously, unless there's a very steep slope or something, I don't think why you cannot push the garage back a little bit and bring it behind the house. So I, I, I would support a detached or attached in the back <laughs> if it's possible. And some, I mean, some work with the plan to reorient and uh, get that work. And as I said, I don't, I don't, I understand that you might have to remove that smaller tree closer to the house, no matter what. Thank you. Anyone else? Actually, um, Mr. Mr. Chair, can I jump in before you make your comments? Yes. Um, this is actually for the applicant, Luke. In light of Commissioner Haynes, uh, Nasser, and uh, Radu's comments, did you want to share that other site plan that you showed me after the staff report was finalized? I think for the other, Not. Something. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No. I just I. Sorry about that. The, that ignore, ignore my comment. connection wasn't yeah, as yeah, yeah. developed as we'd like to present. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can Can I ask one question? Commissioner Radu. 
uh, just is there a reason that the house cannot be like shifted a little bit to the right? It's the two trees on the property line that they're pretty significant trees. And so in consulting with the arborist, they said to hold the existing right side of the house and not build any closer than that and not, you know, discounting that rear projection. And so we're trying to do that as much as possible and, and kind of maintain that footprint on that side. And then we'll probably build that screen porch on piers to minimize impact to the, the root zones back there as well. Thank you. Mr. Doman. Actually, I think this is the staff, but the house that's directly across the street, which is a fairly new infill, do you know when that was built and was that done under, under HPC uh, with a help? So, um, I, I can provide a full background of that when it when this comes back for a hop. So the house across the street was a ranch house that was built in the 1950s that was added on several times subsequently. Um, some of those were done prior to 1986. Other when the district was established, others were done after 1986. So what you have is sort of a a, a non-contributing hybrid that's a mix of things that the HPC did and didn't see. Uh, so it's you know what what you see in its current iteration was something that uh, actually uh, the the architect sitting in front of you's firm completed. I don't know if Luke specifically is responsible for that one. Okay, but but uh, the same firm worked on that. So what you see across the street is is something that um, in its current form the HPC reviewed and approved. I think in two thousand twelve or shortly before I started working here. But I will, I will ensure that the staff report for the HOP has a, and it includes the history of that and, and links to whatever we need to or attaches that as an appendix. Thank you. Um, I um, have not commented. I, I personally would prefer to see the uh, garage detached. Um, however, I am intrigued with Commissioner Haynes' proposal, I think that might have some merit. Uh, I think it sort of does a little bit of both. It uh, connects it to the house, but I'm trying to visualize the, the um, screening that you're proposing. I don't quite have that in my head, but I'm sure that it could be designed. So I think I could probably, I think I could probably uh, approve that. But I think what you have is you got three of us that I think 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 along the lines of uh, Commissioner Haynes. I think you have see a couple who are who are sort of on the fence could go either way. Um, so I think you're on the right track. I, I think everybody likes the design of the house, and I think that's the main thing. And that's I mean that's really what you should. And, and sir, you're you were asking about our any comments about the house design itself. I think we're fine with with it. Um, you know, with the uh, with the uh, materials that you probably will be using, I think every, everybody seems to have, be absolutely fine with the house. I think the issue is the garage, and I think if you uh, spend a little bit more time, try to be a little bit more creative with the with the garage, I think we we will be fine and we'll have an approvable hop. So, thank you for coming, and uh, we look forward to seeing this in the in the near future. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, next next item on the agenda um, are minutes from April 26. Has anyone had a chance to read the min minutes? I will confess I have not. Anyone? Oh dear. <laughs> so I, I would really prefer that someone read the minutes and, and <laughs> make a motion on them, and I will, I will take that on myself. So um, if you could put this on the agenda for next time, the minutes from uh, the 26th and from tonight, and I'll tell you, if someone like myself doesn't read them, I'm going to uh, <laughs> make you sit in the corner, okay? Yeah, yeah, there you go. Thank you. Um, so commission items, um, you all know that our, our planned joint meeting with the planning board has been deferred probably till the fall when we have an entirely new planning board. Um, and the update on the public hearing for the Edward U. Taylor School and Weller's Dry Cleaning Master Plan. I think we had this last time, but I, is there a new, is there something new with that? There is Chair Sutton. So I have two dates uh, to bring to the commission's attention. The public the public hearing record 
has been left open by the council until June 5th. So the HPC testified at the meeting, but if there are other affiliate groups, other people that would like to submit written testimony, they may do so up until June 5th, address that to the county council, reference the item. Also, the PHP committee, the Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee, has scheduled their work session on this item for Monday, June 12th from 9.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Chair Sutton and Commissioner Nasser should plan to attend. If you are unavailable, please let me know. It will be in the, so again, June 12th, which is a Monday from 9.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. in the main council hearing room on the third floor. So it won't be in an annex, it'll be in the main room where they had the public hearing. We were last time? Yes, that's okay. where we were last time. So those are my two updates on that item. Staff items? So the Historic Preservation Office is partnering with Peerless Rockville and Preservation Maryland to host a pop-up for Historic Preservation Month. May is Historic Preservation Month. On this Friday, May the 12th, from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the Red Brick Courthouse in Rockville. If you are available and you'd like to come out and speak with Nick Redding, who is the CEO of Preservation Maryland regarding statewide preservation initiatives, recently adopted leg legislation, uh, Maryland uh, anniversary celebrations. Nick will be there with us all day. And also, as I'd mentioned during our work session, we are looking to schedule an HPC summer retreat on Wednesday, July the 19th. So I will poll people at our next May and June meeting to see who's available and send out an invite for that as well. And that's it. Thank you. And with that, our meeting is adjourned. <laughs>